Good morning. I'm going to speak to this symposium today on the metabolic and cardiovascular risks in obesity. Obesity is classified by the World Health Organization by increments really of five kilograms per meter squared, where normal weight is defined as 18.5 to 24.9, from 25 to 30 is really considered overweight, and then obesity is classed as any BMI over 30 and substratified as class one or mildly obese, less than 35, uh, moderately obese, 35 to less than 40, and severe obesity greater than 40. There are n other potential utilities of methods to assess adiposity that take into account other risk factors that may reasonably um, increase the prospective ability of us to gauge what cardiac or other risks might be. And these um, methods assess the risk of visceral fat or adiposity around the middle of the body inside the viscera. The waist circumference, the waist to height ratio, the waist to hip ratio, the um, waist to hypertriglyceride um, is also another one. And these are clinical tools that are being assessed to better delineate the risk of increasing cardiometabolic risk with weight that can be derived clinically easily from simple lab tests and from measurements at any office visit. Radiographic substudies have shown that CT scans of the belly weighted for fat and MRI with fat um, localization techniques can much better able to discern um, the location of fat. And a new technique, which is called the DEXA scan, which is simply the same scan that we use for bone mineral density, can also be used to identify um, total body fat content, as well as um, a measurement of um, visceral fat is also in research um, techniques. So what about obesity? Well, obesity in America, as we all know, has been increasing over the last 40 years. In fact, obesity has doubled in 40 years in America, and 70% of U.S. citizens are now considered overweight or ov obese, which has increased from 40% 40 years ago. And you can see from 1991 to um, 2010, the average American has gone from, you know, blue in this um, 10 to 20 percent risk of, of being obese to now cons considerably we've had reddening of America with most Americans um, in states with a great propensity of patients over 20 um, BMI over 25. So we can look at um, the prevalence of self-reported obesity by the ba um, behavioral research um, study that's compiling data on um, behavioral risk in the American population. And this is data, the most recent data from 2020, that looks at obesity rates in states. And um, there are now 16 states with BMI over 30 in greater than 35% of the population. Of note, four states joined this um, not so admirable um, designation this year, and Texas was among them. So you can see that this bright, deep, deep crimson red is really the South and the Midwest, and the states that have the lowest weights are Colorado, Hawaii, and Massachusetts, and the states in the West, and also Florida, which is actually unique, um, have lower weights and are in better shape. If you look at the, president, the prevalence of, di of obesity among adults in Texas by region, you can see that some regions have greater levels of obesity, but certainly um, the prevalence of obesity in the state of Texas is the lowest around Austin and the highest in eastern Texas on the Louisiana line, but certainly all of Texas is a really considerably obese. And um, if we look at the percentage of obese high school students um, 
from 2019. The scale here is a lower scale. So in fact, the deepest, darkest purple um, color codes for obesity rates of 15 to 19%. But you can see that the, sta the same states that have high levels of adult obesity have high levels of, of um, high school students with obesity which is a harbinger of the future for us in these states because these teenagers are going to continue, um, if unabated, to become very obese adults, which is gonna increase the need for medical care in the future. If we look at the Burfus data and we break it down by race, we can see that non-Hispanic white adults have you know, obesity rates, this is red or dark red, I mean the center of the country. Um, seriously high rates, certainly the overall percentage of obesity is over 20% in all states in the, unit, in the union, and certainly obesity rates above 30% um, are very common in all the Midwestern states, all the Southern states, and the Rust Belt states. If you break it down by Hispanic and non-Hispanic blacks, you can see a darkening of the crimson red all over the country for Hispanics. So you can see that in the red states, anything red means um, the percentage of obesity over 35% in Hispanic adults. The only states that don't have this high level are the extreme Northeast, Montana and Florida. If you look at it for non-Hispanic blacks, the crimson deep red is present, which means obesity rates over 40% in all the states that are in that deep red, including California. So the metabolic consequences of obesity have been well described. They include an increase in insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and type two diabetes. It also includes hypertension, atherogenic dyslipidemia with total elevated cholesterol, elevated triglycerides, elevated LDL, elevated non-HDL, elevated small, dense, angry LDL particles with low HDL. This is a typical atherogenic pro profile. With increasing obesity rates, there's an excess in LV um, volume and cardiac output goes up. And this leads to ventricular remodeling with concentric hypertrophy, LV and LA dilatation at the late and um, with LV dysfunction um, with heart failure, both of low EF and preserved EF. There's also indications that the metabolic consequences of obesity lead to endothelial dysfunction, which leads to atherosclerosis leads to heart failure, coronary disease, AFib, sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, and cancer. So excess adipose tissue causes sleep apnea, hypoventilation, hypoxia, pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary venous hypertension, and this leads to RV hypertrophy, RV enlargement, and eventually core pulmonal or RV failure. If you look at just the circulating blood volume in obese subjects compared to non-obese subjects, the circulating blood volume is increased. The systemic vascular resistance secondarily increases. And this leads to um, increased pressures and increased wall stress in the heart, which certainly leads to eccentric LV hypertrophy when adequately compensated leads to only diastolic LV dysfunction, but when inadequate, it leads to systolic as well as diastolic heart failure. It's important to note that for every one point increase in BMI, it raises the risk of heart failure by 5% in men and 7% in women. So if we look at death from any cause according to BMI, it's well known to be associated with a J-shaped curve such that when BMIs are below normal or below 18.5, there's this little uptick at the bottom of the J of increased mortality, which is thought to be mitigated by um, physical fitness. Certainly patients or um, cohorts with low BMIs, 
may actually be selecting for patients with cachexia and chronic illness. So in this important study, where 1.46 million patients were followed in a cancer consortium in 19 cohorts with an average 10-year follow-up, the subjects were um, stratified by those that had never stroked and uh, that had never smoked, pardon me, and for those that were otherwise healthy. And in this group, certainly this is the blue curve. There is a mitigation in that lower end of the J-shaped curve, as well as a mitigation of mortality at the upper ends of the BMI. But see here, as the BMI increases above 20, all the way to 45, there is a doubling of the hazard ratio or a doubling of the risk of death, which may partially be, be um, influenced by obesity. Certain in a subject of this number, it gives more um, um, confidence that there's really an abnormality related to BMI. The optimal BMI in this um, subject cohort was determined to be between 22.5 and 24.9. So what is it about obesity that gives such heterogeneity? Because in fact, BMI itself is never, has never been determined to be an independent cardiovascular risk modulator. It's not an independent risk factor in the Framingham Heart Study or in any pooled cohort equations for risk estimation. The thought is that the traditional risk factors for heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and high cholesterol are confounders of obesity. Another factor that may play into the BMI not being an explainable independent cardiac risk factor is this obesity paradox, which has been seen in many cohorts at this point, which describes the fact that obese patients with a chronic illness may have better outcomes of an acute exacerbation of that illness compared to the non-obese. And there are a lot of considerations why this may be true, and there's not enough time to divulge into that at this point. But another factor that may make BMI not an independent risk is that obesity has many phenotypes. And one of the phenotype of obesity is those patients that are obese may actually be very fit. And this fitness phenotype may mitigate the risk otherwise that obesity poses. More importantly, the topography of adipose tissue or where adipose tissue is deposited has most recently been um, postulated to be a better predictor of cardiometabolic risk in these pooled um, cohort equations. There is a term called the metabolically healthy obese, which has been um, identified in some of these large cohorts. And in these cohorts, the obesity at BMI of over 30, that's associated with no other metabolic risk, so no high blood pressure, no low HDL, no elevated LDL, triglycerides or glucose, are considered at baseline to be a relatively unique group, but not uncommon. So in the NHANES database, 51% of overweight individuals in this cohort were considered metabolically healthy, whereas 32% of the obese were metabolically healthy and obese. So in this group, it's thought that there may be less risk, but subsequent studies have shown that the metabolically healthy but obese are still at increased risk compared to normal weight, metabolically normal individuals in three separate cohorts. In those that have been followed for 10-year mortality and for cardiac events, there was a 24% increased risk of um, a negative outcome in those that are metabolically um, healthy but obese compared to um, normal weight, metabolically normal individuals. This has also been shown the metabolically healthy obese have also been shown to have increased risks of heart failure compared to the non-obese, 
particularly in those individuals with severe obesity and with long-standing obesity. So in fact, how long you've been um, obese may have um, um, an effect on your outcome. And certainly in cardiovascular disease, the metabolically healthy obese have a 60% increased risk in a meta, meta-analysis of 22 studies when compared to those that have normal weight and are otherwise metabolically normal. Fat distribution, it turns out, is um, an important risk modifier and the phenotype of the greatest risk would be those with visceral adiposity versus subcutaneous adiposity and the severity of how um, obese people, um, patients are has an impact as well. So in this study, I mean in this um, cartoon, you can see two individuals, a 67-year-old male with a BMI of 25 and visceral fat of 2.6 liters per meter squared and kind of low skeletal muscle mass. Look at the legs of the guy on the left. He's kind of skinny obese. In fact, his skeletal muscle mass is low and he has a lot of visceral adiposity compared to the gentleman to the right who's a 53-year-old um, man with a BMI of 30 but a visceral fat of only 0.9. These two individuals have pretty disparate risks, although the guy on the right has the BMI just barely in the obese range, whereas the guy on the left has a lot of visceral obesity, but overall his BMI is only 25. So in fact, the heterogeneity of where we put adipose tissue can be subcutaneous, which has been deemed to have less metabolic risk. In fact, the subcutaneous fat may actually be unique in its healthy mechanism because it acts as a buffer for free fatty acids, which are collected when we have excess food intake. And it can be easily shuttled into the subcutaneous tissue and um, uh, access easily for times of increased physical demand and low caloric um, consumption. Visceral fat is really kind of a nasty fat in that it's dysmetabolic. It contributes the most to the dysmetabolic state of insulin resistance. Um, it contributes to atherogenetic, atherogenic um, um, lipid profile and an inflammatory milieu. All of these things contribute to increase cardiovascular risk and potentially adverse major cardiac events. A third kind of adiposity is ectopic adiposity, which includes most commonly, by definition, um, distribution of fat into tissues that don't normally store fat. The most common place where we see an abnormality of fat deposition is in liver um, concentration of fat, which has been um, demarcated as an excess risk factor for heart disease and with liver failure, which is non-alcoholic non steatohepatitis. Ectopic fat distribution has been shown to be um, distributed in the heart and around the heart in the pericardium, as well as in skeletal muscle tissue. Severe adiposity is a, associated with a BMI over 40 and in a BMI over 35 with one additional risk from obesity. The factors that are associated with visceral adiposity include increasing biomarkers of hypertension, insulin resistance, inflammation, high triglycerides, remember that, and high triglycerides are associated with small dense lipoproteins which increase their atherogenic profile. These biomarkers increase the risk for atherosclerosis. The deposition of calcium in the coronary arteries and such increase the coronary calcium score and lead to the deposition of plaque within the aorta. Certainly, um, visceral adiposity by definition is liver fatty disease. And lifestyle behaviors, including sedentary behavior, poor nutrition, high caloric intake, and sweetened sugary beverages, 
alcohol intake as well as smoking have been associated with the um, deposition of fat in the visceral um, location. Increasing age, sex distributions, and race um, certainly plays a role, and we're going to get to that in a little bit. Certainly genetics play a role in where you put your fat. A key and central illustration to visceral fat and cardiac risk is demonstrated in this slide that shows a guy with genetic susceptibility who's got energy in more than energy out, and he has two choices to put fat. He can put the fat into subcutaneous adipose tissue uh, or in visceral adipose tissue all on the right of the screen, which leads to fat infiltration of this visceral um, organs, which leads to fatty liver, fatty heart, atherosclerosis, as opposed to the guy who puts his fat in the subcutaneous tissue, which is metabolically more inert and doesn't increase the risk of heart disease. Ectopic adipose tissue certainly is seen in NASH, and unknown metabolic and genetic factors certainly are driving this ectopic fat deposition into these ectopic tissues. Severe adiposity associated with a BMI over 40 or a BMI over 35 with one additional risk modulator. Women are more likely than men to have severe adiposity, and as our slides show, African Americans are at greater risk than Hispanic, who are at greater risk than white people, but certainly no one in our country is immune from severe adiposity, which is um, growing much more common over time. The highest risk of cardiovascular disease is associated with severe adiposity, certainly, most importantly, heart failure. In fact, 9.2% of the U.S. population in 2020 was characterized as severely obese, but almost 20% of patients that have heart failure have severe obesity. So how do we measure adiposity? Well, the BMI is the easiest and most standardized measurement. It's in all the databases. It's in every patient's medical record. It's just the weight in kilograms divided by the square root of the height in centimeters. Certainly, addition of waist circumference is a better indicator of, as an index of total body fat. It also is an indicator of increased mortality risk in all BMI categories and is certainly an indicator of increased visceral adiposity, which as we've described, is a greater risk um, to the health of our society. The waist to hip, the waist to height, are also measurements that are easily obtained um, to estimate visceral fat. The interesting factor is that high triglycerides, when combined with the waist circumference may be a better indicator of visceral adiposity, and many um, research projects are looking at this, so stay tuned to future research that's going to come out looking at whether or not elevated triglycerides with an elevated waistline has an added benefit in all BMI categories. Certainly, CT scans are research tools that have radiation exposure MRIs are also unique and used for research. They're a little bit more time consuming. Both of these techniques are more expensive. The DEXA is kind of a unique opportunity to do quick, kind of cheapish studies to look at how much fat is in the body and whether or not it's viscerally um, concentrated. So here's a slide that looks at these potential uses for screening tests, but importantly, Many of these tests are um, related to the ethnic um, propensity of a population to have visceral adiposity. So you can see that in Southeast Asians and in Japanese, um, visceral adiposity is more prevalent at lower waistline um, circumferences. So there's a lower threshold for calling somebody abnormal in Japanese, Chinese, and in Southeast Asians compared to patients of European descent.
this Edmonton obesity um, staging system has been developed and may be helpful to associate obesity with other metabolic and functional limitations related to obesity. And um, you can use this um, for um, categorization of your clinic patients into better treatment groups. The benefits of obesity are important because really we've identified a subgroup of Americans and citizens all over the world that are at excess risk for um, metabolic and cardiometabolic risk. But what can we do and how does treatment of obesity affect their outcome? So it turns out that the three slides to the right demonstrate the results of the Diabetes Prevention Program, which is a UK-based um, intensive um, interventional lifestyle um, that was done in patients who had prediabetes, which encouraged a 7% or greater weight loss with 150 minutes of weekly exercise. And in this study, the top um, slide shows on the right that there was um, a 58% versus 31% reduction in the onset of type 2 diabetes with the intensive lifestyle modification compared to metformin, which was intermediate to placebo. The benefits of this program persisted for a long term, which says that lifestyle intervention should be the hallmark of what we strive for. Unfortunately, the risks of keeping the lifestyle intervention going at 15 years diminished, and so there was attenuation of the effect over time, although there was a reduction in cardiovascular risk factors. You can see that on the side, um, two slides. Of note, the Look Ahead, or Action for Health and Diabetes trial, looked at 5,100 individuals with type 2 diabetes and a BMI over 25. They were randomized to intensive lifestyle versus regular diabetes education. Unfortunately, there was no benefit to major adverse cardiac events, which may be because a rigorous intervention isn't enough to make the risk decline. So the treatment of obesity really is centered dramatically with lifestyle modification. I would submit to you that lifestyle modification needs to precede the development of obesity because if we encourage our citizens to live a healthy, active lifestyle with a concentration of plant-based diet with low-ish red meats and careful attention to, you know, lean white meats, chicken and fish, then we might improve our society by preventing obesity, which is probably a better way to do it. But once people have become obese, certainly diet and exercise are the fundamentals of treatment for obesity-related complications. Certainly, the Mediterranean diet has been shown in patients at risk for cardiac events to decrease cardiac events even without weight loss among those that have diabetes in a study. Exercise itself has been shown to decrease visceral fat much greater than it reduces BMI and that this weight waste loss is more important than weight loss in the trajectory of treatment in um, the obese. Certainly, exercise without weight loss significantly improves insulin sensitivity, improves cardiac risk factors, and biological risk factors better, actually, than pharmacologic interventions. Cardiometabolic fitness is the goal, and the goal should be encouraged at every possible way we can in American society and in all visits to healthcare professionals. Weight loss itself is always the good goal, but I really try to emphasize the things that you can control, which includes your diet and your exercise routine, because in many patients, weight loss is very difficult, and the lack of weight loss leads to um, um, decreased ability to participate in a diet and exercise program because people get so sad that they, they didn't lose weight quickly.
The reduction in weight is also associated, obviously, with a reduction in visceral fat, an increase in lean muscle mass, a decrease in cardiometabolic risk, and a decrease in ectopic fat deposition. But most importantly, 50% of people that lose weight have a remission in their um, expected rates of diabetes. Pharmacologic agents are listed here, but I'm going to concentrate on an important study this summer which looked at semaglutide treatment in people with obesity but without diabetes. So semaglutide is a, um, a GLP-1 agonist, which is important treatment in diabetes that has been shown to reduce um, cardiovascular events, notably heart failure, and um, in patients treated with up to one milligram weekly subcutaneously in those that have diabetes. In this study, however, they took 1,961 non-diabetic obese patients with a BMI over 30 or a BMI over 27 with one additional risk factor. And they were treated with a scaled up approach, placebo, double-blinded, two to one um, randomization schema to semaglutide versus placebo. And you can see in the top um, schematic that as the dose is escalating, and it escalates every four weeks from 0.25 to 0.5 to 1 to 2 to 2.4, it takes a while to get to the peak dose, but weight loss starts occurring by two weeks into the treatment trial with the lowest dose of semaglutide, which says that this has a pretty profound effect on weight loss. The GLP-1 agonists have been known to decrease appetite, decrease gastric emptying, and to reduce glucose um, over time. Certainly, the thought is that um, in this study that the weight loss may be contributing to the effect of the treatment. Certainly, we see in this treatment trial that a third of patients lost over 20% of their body weight, which is by far the largest intervention pharmacologically for weight loss that's ever been seen, which is the reason I highlight this study today. 55% of the population lost greater than 15%, and 75% of the population lost greater than 10%. So certainly in this study, which beat the diabetes prevention um, program considerably, because that was just a 7.5% um, total body weight loss. Seventy-five percent of these patients achieved over ten percent weight loss, which is staggering. So you would expect that in this population, if they were at increased risk for diabetes, that it would have a significant impact on that in the future. The reduction in waist circumference in this trial was thirteen and a half centimeters versus four which certainly argues that there was a significant reduction in visceral adipose tissue. This trial went to 68 weeks, and you can see that the curve split early and that there was continuing benefit really out to 60, 50, late 50, 60 weeks where there was a plateau of the effect. When we looked at semaglutide in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, 300 in NASH patients were um, randomized with fibrosis and a BMI over 25 with or without diabetes to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.4 versus placebo. And in this group, um, steatohepatitis rates were dramatically reduced, although fibrosis um, um, was not significantly altered in the entire group, although in the group that got the 0.4 semaglutide, there was a reduction in fibrosis, but the, the trial was not powered to look at this um, treatment effect um, at that low rate. Bariatric surgery is by means probably the best weight loss producing um, remedy for severe obesity. Candidates for bariatric surgery include the severe obese with a BMI over 40 or those with a BMI over 35 with additional risk, including NASH with fibrosis after they failed a six-month lifestyle modification.
the bariatric surgery options now include really two um, um, surgical procedures. The gastric ruin Y bypass, which is being performed in about 20 to 25% of cases, and the sleeve gastrectomy, which has turned out to be really um, um, efficacious procedure. Originally, it was intended as just the first phase of the gastric bypass in the super obese, in whom weight loss was hopefully um, going to be activated and a secondary surgery for the full bypass was planned for later. But with sleeve gastrectomy at 75% of the procedures today, the sleeve gastrectomy has overtaken all forms of gastric um, surgery options. The gastric banding is a, um, less prevalent because it doesn't have enduring results and is now performed in less than 5% of cases. Of note, Gastric bypass or um, sleeve gastrectomy is associated with significant sustained weight loss, at least 60%, 66% of the body mass, and certainly even greater for gastric full bypass at 70 to 80%. Visceral adiposity is decreased 40 to 50%, as well as subcutaneous adipose tissue decreasing by 10%. So primarily, the weight loss from gastric surgery is visceral adiposity, which is really what you want to get rid of because it's the nasty fat. Diabetes remission rates for the bypass and the gastrectomy is about 66%. By banding early on, it may be 29%, but that is attenuated over time. The benefits of gastric surgery decrease the risk of heart failure, decrease risk of NASH and liver failure. In the end, obesity affects every aspect of a person's lives, from health to relationships, to how you feel about yourself, to orthopedic injuries, to the increased risk of cancer, and suddenly every opportunity that we can to reinforce a healthy lifestyle and plant-based diet should be um, followed in order to improve the health in our lives. Thank you for participating in this conference today. Your attendance is so, so helpful um, to helping sustain this symposium over the, over the years. Thanks again.